Hello Steelers and welcome to this review of Blood and Valor by Firelock Games. This was published back in 2019, or the second printing at least was published back in 2019. Uh, my pal James lent me a copy of this because he recently bought it uh, and he wanted, uh, well actually I wanted to have a look at it because it's a First World War skirmish game and uh, as I'm sure you're probably aware there's not a huge amount of First World War skirmish games out there. Uh, a lot of them uh, will really be the larger scale games, so divisional such as Great War Spearhead or even battalion levels such as uh, Square Bashing. There are things like Two Fat Lardies Through the Mud and the Blood, which uh, personally is uh, one of my favourite games. I think it's excellent and obviously I'm going to be uh, probably talking a little bit about this as I, as I review this particular game in particular. Now one of my particular interests, if you're if you're a, a, a regular viewer of this channel, you will probably be aware that one of my regular my main interests is the First World War, and within that, my uh, particular interest is how the First World War is perceived by the public, and also you know how it comes across in media and various different things as well. So I was quite interested in seeing how Firelock Games handle the First World War because I generally see that a lot of war gamers misrepresent the First World War in many ways uh, there really seems to be quite a misunderstanding as to how it was fought and as I say this kind of comes down into into a lot of rules such as uh, people saying well you can only fight at, at high level uh, divisional level for example core level that kind of thing uh, trenches will basically stop you playing any kind of war game in the First World War. Now I think that, personally I think that's complete nonsense. Uh, I have proven that to be incorrect already on this channel several times with uh, several battle reports of different games at skirmish level and also uh, at the battalion level as well with uh, with various versions of I Ain't Been Shot Mum, uh, Through the Mud and the Blood, Chain of Command, Square Bashing and other bits and pieces as well. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and I am going to say I haven't actually played this game, but I have read it and I know enough about uh, wargaming rules, I think, to, to be able to, to give you an idea of, at least, or at least for me to understand how the game would work. So, with my interest in the First World War, as I say, I was particularly interested in seeing how this, this game uh, comes up to scratch. And uh, <laughs> I'll say here and now, unfortunately, I found it lacking. But what I'm going to do is with this review, I'm going to break it into two different parts. Uh, I'm going to look at it from a game point of view, and then I'm going to look at it from a historical point of view, uh, because I think it would be a little bit unfair, really, just for me just to go straight in hammer and tongs, and just to uh, really, uh, because there are two two aspects to every set of rules anyway. So what I'll do is, first of all, we'll, we'll have a look inside the book. Uh, I'll show you some of the basic rules. And there's some quite nice stuff in here that, that I do like. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, and then we'll come back at it and we'll have a look at it from a historical point of view. And I think that is, as I say, about the only fair thing I can really do with this. So let's give it a go. Okay, so the first thing to notice is hardback, obviously, uh, really nicely produced actually, it's a really uh, lovely book. Um, it currently is, or at least it says on the back here, it's selling for $34.99, which is, I think about, about £25 or something like that. So probably about average for a, uh, a, a book of this size and production as well, I mean these are only small uh, small prints uh, or short prints so you do end up paying quite a bit for for rules as well and this high level of production does actually continue well into uh, the the pages itself quite a nice thick uh, paper and it's printed on glossy paper and you, as you can see immediately lots of uh, color photos uh, so let's get that into it. then we've got our contents page here it goes through uh, we've got a chronology then game essentials, which obviously you normally have, how the turns work, the terrain you need, uh, range combat, close combat, building a force, force list, starting a game, scenarios, tanks, and then an index as well, which is pretty good. I'll just jump quickly to show you that the index is actually pretty comprehensive there, uh, several pages of it. So it's, I do like to see an index in uh, rules because it just makes it a lot quicker to run, try to find something, you know. So there's several pages there of an index. As well as your contents as well. Uh, the more people that put indexes into rules, the better as far as I'm concerned. So let's just jump forward. Uh, short introduction. Lots of glossy pictures, which is never a bad thing. Um, 
I'm going to come back to this a little bit later on though, uh, but we do have uh, you know these nice pictures of, of games going on and things. We've got this little chronology here. One thing I'm going to note here is, before I go any further, is uh, although most of the major uh, aspects of the war are counted, and we've got a big space here, so they could have fitted this in. August the 8th is missing, 1918, Battle of Amiens. Uh, it's the battle that basically is a massive combined arms attack by uh, the British and the French, uh, and it basically sends the Germans over the edge and ends the war 100 days later. A very small American counter-attack of the Battle of Bellu Wood is mentioned, but not the Battle of Amiens. Mm, that's uh, interesting, that, but it is what it is. Uh, OK, so we uh, move into the, uh, the game essentials. Uh, basic stuff here for you know most war game rules just gives you some ideas of uh, how how the game plays what you need to play it what miniatures you use this is for 28 mil but it would work equally well with 15 mil or anything else you wanted to use as well really then we also talk a little bit about uh, just some of the basics concepts of the game as well uh, I'm not going to go too much into these because most of these are pretty basic uh, for most games now this is an interesting mechanic that I like. This is the uh, the game turn overview, and you have a bidding system in this. So this is a really nice mechanic that I like. Each of your units has a certain amount of, uh, what do they call it, initiative points. So it says for core units, depending on the core units it is, it has two or three. For a commander they have two, and in support units they have one. So you add all those together, and then you and the uh, your opponent you bid out of that pool, and then whoever bids the highest between one and six, uh, or zero and six, should I say, uh, whoever bids the highest then uh, gets to take a turn with one of their units, and then the unit has two actions, which is quite nice. Uh, it's a quite a nice free-flowing game. So basically, if you really want to do something before your opponent, you would put in a high bid. If you wanted to hold back, you would put in a low bid. And also, as well, if you bid zero, uh, you get one less action, so it's almost like you know you're losing initiative as well. I quite like that, and I think it's a really nice little mechanic that works very well for us. Uh, a, a, a really quick skirmish game, which I think this is really what this is aimed at, and I do like that. It says uh, also here if, uh, tied initiative rolls, uh, tied initiative bids. You roll a d10, and then whoever has the highest has the initiative. I would probably change that ever so slightly, and then just give them a, a d10 roll plus however many initiative points they have left in total, uh, just again, just so it's not just a straight dice roll. But each to their own, I think you know that would have just added a little bit more to it. But it adds a little bit of friction, and again, people who probably watch this channel a lot know that I like friction. So you don't know if you're going to get the you're going to get the bid or if you're going to be able to uh, move before your opponent. And obviously, every time you bid points in, that comes out of your total as well. So you either you know go middling and, and hold some points back or you go all in and try to get that first move in as well so I really like that and I think that's something that could work quite easily with uh, lots of other games uh, I don't know if this is in their other Blood and uh, X games that they do like Blood and Plunder and Blood and Steel I don't know, I think in Blood and Plunder they have a card activation uh, but obviously in this one it is more about this round bidding and the nice thing about it is it means you don't actually need any extras for uh, for the game. So you're, you're just basically, you know, you, you you can just play straight away just with a, a couple of dice and tokens and things. So that's quite nice. Then we have the basic actions. These are pretty simple. So we've got advance, charge, run, shoot, aim, rally, take cover, and each unit does two of these. Uh, what is interesting is that this is quite obviously... Uh, I, th I would say the game, I think, is quite obviously aimed, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, uh, aimed at uh, people who are coming from the Warhammer stable of games, uh, games workshop kind of stuff, because the advance is four inches, <laughs> which I think is the average move for uh, most infantry models in Warhammer from uh, memory. So uh, it's uh, you know, you're basically just showing people something complete, uh, something that they're already used to. Personally... And again, a lot of people watching this these videos will probably realise this. I don't particularly like uh, fixed movement rates. I would prefer to see like a D6 for an advance uh, run on 2D6, you know, that kind of thing. But that's just because I play a lot of Lardy games and I do like that variable movement in there, uh, not knowing if you're actually going to make your objective or not for the turn. So I, th I think... Uh, 
but again, a lot of people like this kind of play, and that if that's what they like, then that's what they like for us, and you know, happy, happy for that. Uh, then when we do cover terrain as well. And there's not a huge amount of terrain, so you basically got your uh, cover bonuses here. You've just got soft cover, hard cover, then you're in elevated, and also uh, if it's an area like a forest or something. So there's not a huge amount about terrain in there. Pretty typical of most uh, most skirmish games, really. Again, I'm not going to go too much into that because there isn't much point. What we do have though is range combat. Uh, this game I th think is generally meant to be played on a on a smaller scale table, so a four by four, three by three, depending on how many points you've got in the game itself. It tells you that later on. So we actually have uh, rangers will go over uh, all over the table, which is something I do like to see, uh, especially at this scale, because you know a rifle bullet doesn't just stop at twenty four inches like it does in some rules, mentioning no names. Uh, but you do have modifiers depending on how close you are so if you're close uh, up to six inches uh, if you're six to twelve inches it's harder than 12 to 18 then 18 plus so there are modifiers on that range which is quite nice uh, and these are pluses because we'll talk about it in a second as to why this is the case uh, this is because you have to roll over a certain number to hit and this is your stat line here We've got a mention here of the different types of range weapon types. So we've got uh, submachine guns, flamethrowers, heavy machine guns, light machine guns, sniper rifles, pistols, rifles, grenades, trench catapults, rifle grenades, and infantry support gun. All the stuff you would expect to see in the First World War, which is no problem. And then we also have barrages and gas barrages and naval barrages. Now, I'm a little less happy about these simply because... This is not the way that artillery works in the First World War. Uh, in particular, you know, uh, artillery was used for very specific reasons. It wouldn't be firing onto individual skirmish uh, fights. It would be used as a large area uh, battery uh, from several batteries firing in. Very rarely would you see, you know, just a single gun firing at a single target. It would be several guns firing at a target unless they were ranging. Gas... Uh, is used very much as a uh, embuggeration rather than uh, to, to quote Peter Hart to uh, uh, rather than an attacking weapon because you don't want to be having your troops attacking into gas. It's used to cut areas off behind the attack. It's also used as well to douse uh, enemy artillery to stop it. So this would be way off table. So having gas on a war gaming table to me never ever really strikes as real but that is part of the historical thing but again you know we're talking about a war game here if this is what people want you know everybody thinks that gas is a big part of the first world war it is and it isn't uh, but there's a lecture in that on its own so close combat uh, again the uh, I'm not going to go through this. This is what it is. Basically, you have to roll for combat and for shooting. You roll on a, <coughs> or basically on your fight skill. Uh, so you have a set of fight skills, shooting skills, fighting skills, and you roll a d10 for them. And it says here, uh, for each of the target number, of this is the fight skill value after the applicable modifiers. So you basically take a modifier and you add add that on. And if you get over it, a 10 is always a hit. It's on d10s, by the way. If a 10 is always a hit and a one is always a miss so this is the basic stuff uh, here we have the uh, the the force list so that's that's pretty much as far as the rules run up to page 34 so we've got page 34 there uh, including that the introduction stuff then we talk about the building of a force uh, and the force lists and basically how you choose how many points you want. So it says 150 points for your first game, so probably pretty small. And then each nationality or force has characteristics here. So these are the characteristics. Again, this is a stat line very similar, as I said before, to things like Warhammer 40k and even uh, Fantasy Battle. In that you have, you know, weapon skill, ballistic skill, move, uh, toughness, strength, all those things. This is pretty similar here. So we've got shoot, close combat, shoot, save, close combat, save, resolve, which is your, uh, which is morale. Then the cost, unit cost, you can see here 16, this is 16, and this is four riflemen. Uh, so you can add, uh, you can put four riflemen in there. And that is 16 points. So that gives you an idea. If you've got 150 
points game. If you just had riflemen, you'd have about about 40, I guess, 40 figures. So thereabouts, you know, it's a, it's a, a typical skirmish kind of game. And then initiative, this is how many points you add on uh, for your force list, as we said at the start with the bidding, uh, the bit that uh, I thought was quite nice and innovative. So that would, if you had, you know, 10 units of, of, uh, of these, uh, so 40 figures, you would then end up with 30 initiative, for example, to bid on throughout your term. Then you also have some special rules, which you always, always have to have as well, uh, and some you you do get commanders as well, uh, which can give out extra orders throughout the turn as well. You only, I think you only ever have one commanding or, uh, officer, uh, which I find is quite restricted, but that's just the way it is. And then we go on to these force lists. So we have the British Army here with various uh, heroes as well, named people. So we have, uh, let's have a look, we've got just British Lieutenant and a British Captain. Uh, we also have here uh, British Major. And then we've got people like uh, Edgar Towner, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, of course. Uh, they've obviously come off the back of fantasy games. Uh, a few other people, Williams, uh, Major Williams here, and then some inexperienced and a couple of other bits and pieces, support units as well, just to show these things in here. And we also have some extra rules a little bit for like the campaign in the Near East. Let's jump across a little bit, I'll just show you some of these other ones. So we've got the Australians, the Anzacs Corps here as well. Then we've got the German army here. There's quite a lot of these lists actually, the German East Africa army. Uh, then we have the French army, moving through it, Ottoman. Ottoman armies in both the Americans, uh, the Belgians, and then also a small section here on the early force builder as well because a lot of these units are for later war so they've got rifle grenades and, uh, and bombs and uh, Lewis guns and things like that. So this is uh, quite slight uh, later on. Then just again to run through uh, the rest of the book for you here. We've got the start in the game. It shows you how to uh, to run through your game. Determine your board size. As I said, it it's basically starts with a 3x3 three three board, 3x4 three foot board, or up to a 3x6 board, depending on how many points you're using. So, so the smaller game, uh, the smaller the board, basically. And then you can choose a scenario. You can roll for it here. You've got meeting engagements, breakthrough, gather intelligence, conquest, or demolition. Kill points is the number of uh, points to determine what units are destroyed uh, and basically uh, after he says it, let me just go through it here, uh, Barrages uh, uh, players with the most kill points will break tie and this is the winner if uh, after kill points are tallied there is a tie, the game remains a tie so this is basically how you end your game uh, by causing a certain amount of kill points uh, and a few other bits and pieces there. So scenarios these are the different kinds of scenarios. It's always nice to see that they've got some example ones here. So the ones that were, you can roll for here. So go into engagement, you break through intelligence gathering and conquest. Interestingly, they all look almost exactly the same, <laughs> apart from having an objective in the center in conquest. Uh, so you're basically just setting up by the back end of the board on both of these, which is quite interesting. Uh, also got some narrative scenarios as well. So a knocked out tank a downed pilot, a night raid, Actung sniper, tank assault. And then finally we go on to a section about tanks because obviously tanks were used in the First World War. Uh, not to massive success, again as much as wargamers like to have them on the table. Uh, they were used but generally within a day most of them have broken down or been knocked out. And they weren't used as assault vehicles as they were in the Second World War. They were used really as mobile pillboxes. So this is something, again, that uh, uh, as war gamers, uh, they, in general, uh, a lot of them will get this uh, mixed up with Second World War stuff. But we've got uh, rules for tanks here. And then the different types of tanks. So we've got the A7V, of which about 20 were ever actually made anyway. Uh, then we've got the British uh, typical ones, the Mark IV, a Mark IV male and females, with either with a six pounder for the male or the uh, heavy machine guns for the female. 
and then we also have uh, a couple more options as well so this one is that's another mark 4 i don't know why we've got a double mark 4 up here all right so this, this is because this is the germans uh, captured mark 4 so this is the british mark 4s uh, so a bit strange that they've given a couple of pages to that we've got the whippets the light tanks and then the french uh, the renault ft17 and also their saint chamond no Schneider tank though I notice, uh, so they're not covered all of the tanks. But as I said, then we just run on to the index here very quickly, just to show you that it's there. Uh, we also have a player aid which you can photocopy if you want to. Uh, some t game tokens you can cut out or photocopy and cut out. And then the figure line as well. And a couple of adverts at the back end are for some more of their stuff, so Blood and Plunder and Oak and Iron. And then notes pages and pages of notes if you want to make some notes okay so i just want to run back and i want to talk about really a bit, little bit about it historically from a historical point of view now as i say the game is very simple from a from my point of view i don't particularly like stat lines so let me just jump through to these uh be, that's just a personal choice some people will like them if you're coming into this from say Warhammer then you will probably be used to this kind of thing and you will, won't, won't have much of a problem with it to be perfectly honest but let's take a little bit of a look at some of these in some detail from a, a historical point of view now the game is saying it's basically supposed to be a, a skirmish game and it says really it's more, mainly about um, it's mainly about uh, trench raids and things like that. Now, again, this is another a mistaken thing that a lot of uh, war gamers fall into. When when we talk about trench raids, uh, the, in, the 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 thing that most people think of is uh, only you know a handful of men getting into the enemy trench and capturing prisoners and uh, and causing a bit of aggro. Now, that certainly did happen. However, they were pretty organised things, especially on the British side, because they wanted to retain control of no man's land and make sure that the Germans were continually on the back foot uh, and under pressure. So, trench raids were organised really from anything from platoon size all the way up to including battalion size. Basically, a trench raid in the First World War is anything that isn't a major operation. So, this could be, you know, it's, this, is, this is not them trying to capture territory, this is them just trying to disrupt the enemy. Uh, they would sometimes be uh, supported heavily by artillery and that kind of thing. Now... Fair enough, you know, we're playing a skirmish game here, so we are on the smaller end of it. But again, this is just something that a lot of war gamers don't really realise about the First World War. It's very different. Uh, I mentioned the stat lines. I did have a look through some of these, and strangely enough, you know, this is because these are all, all, uh, these are all just humans at the end of the day. So they are trained to the best of their ability. So from my point of view, stat lines just don't really work for this kind of thing. It's like having, you know, uh, stat lines in Warhammer 40k, but just using a human army. Uh, so they're all going to be pretty much exactly the same, apart from one or two. And it's the same in this. I was checking some of the uh, the, the numbers in here, and the British and the, the German riflemen are exactly the same. It just feels a little bit like there's quite a lot of wasted uh, paper in here, where you could put something else in, like some history, uh, just to tell you basically the same thing. And I know it's like, you know, it's an individual uh, army list that they can make up. Uh, so you just go straight to that army list. But I just think, you know, you could just say, right, this is an infantryman. This is what their stats are. And you don't have to say if it's British or German because they are pretty much the same. Uh, there's a couple of extra little uh, bits and pieces here that they add in. And again, this could all be condensed into just a couple of pages quite easily, really, uh, without having pages and pages and pages of force lists because this is what a large part of this book actually is it goes all the way up to let's just run through 60 70 uh, it goes up to 70 page 78 and it starts on uh, 41 so there's as many as much force lists as there are for uh, for the actual rules in fact it's, it's about the same I think probably a little bit more for the actual force list and the rules themselves now the rules themselves are probably the, to me they seem a little vanilla I do like the uh, the, the idea of, of using uh, the bidding system uh, the idea of you know rolling a d10 over the stat 
I'm sure it works. I'm sure it works pretty well. Uh, but I prefer D6s just because everybody has them. D10s, you know, I don't have a huge amount of D10s. So if I had a lot of figures, I'd be rolling double, doubling up on a lot of these. That's, again, something very personal. But the thing I don't like about this is this idea of having force lists and just being able to shove in whatever you want. Now, by the end of the war, uh, and this is something, again, that people who have probably watched this video will, uh, will know, the British... Uh, sorry, watch my videos. Uh, the British had developed uh, SS-143, the training pamphlet, which basically broke the platoon down into four sections, four very separate sections. Each of these sections would have eight men in them, and you would have riflemen, you would have grenadiers, uh, bombers uh, throwing grenades, you would have rifle grenadiers, and you would have Lewis, Lewis team. This changed slightly in 1918, with the rifle grenadiers being dropped and more Lewis is added into this platoon mix. But they were very, very different and very distinct uh, sections. So, you know, if somebody's coming into this game with no knowledge of the First World War, they're given... Uh, the choice to add in uh, whatever they want into their core units. So let me just find it where with the rifle grenadiers and things. Uh, so here we are. The, uh, we've got uh, trench specialists here, uh, sniper team. Uh, let me just try and find it. But basically you can add in uh, any of these support weapons into your platoons. But as I say, they were actually, they were put in as a... Uh, they were the very specific within the platoon. So it's not a case of just like, you know... 10 men would be distributed with uh, a couple of rifle grenades and then some bombs and then a Lewis gun within the same section. Uh, this is a mistake a lot of these make as well. So uh, this is this is an issue for me, just the fact that you know there's, there's no description of this and there's no, uh, in the force list you would think that you could just say, right, this is a platoon, this is how it's made up. Uh, and as I said, the, given the amount of space that has been taken up, A, by pictures and also by notes, there's plenty of space in here to do this kind of thing. Now, I did mention it before, through the mud and the blood, by the two fat lardies goes into great detail about the platoon makeup of each of the main nations so the british the french the germans and the americans so you've got some really good background information straight away and this stuff is not hard to find to be perfectly honest uh this is this from my point of view just feels world war one light it's uh you know it's a chance for people to get some world war one figures or first world war figures and just put them on the table and move them around as though they're playing first world war warhammer uh and that to me just doesn't uh doesn't chime right from a historical point of view now you know all props to, to Blood and Valor and the guys there for actually, you know, doing something in the First World War. But I just thought, I just think a little bit more, from a historical point of view, a little bit more thought could be put into actually making it more like the period and not just like any other period uh, of gaming, you know, that is pretty generic. And again, we could argue that we have, uh, you know, we're doing a trench raid, so there is a mix of weapons, which is... You know, it's, it's something that happened. However, uh, it, they even then you would still have you wouldn't have rifle grenades mixed in with uh, the bombers and with the riflemen simply because they were doing specific jobs of specific tasks. Uh, and it just feels a little bit like in this, you can just buy whatever you want and just stick them in, and it doesn't really matter. So uh, this is my major issue with it from a historical point of view, and uh, I've you know I find it. Uh, that the, the, this is similar to a lot of wargaming rules and as I say you know a, what, at least one major blunder being that we have in the chronology here we're missing out one of the major battles of the war uh, we've got a few other bits and pieces in here as well I've not gone through it with a fine comb tooth bro uh, fine fine tooth bro uh, tooth comb <laughs> uh, but I'm fairly sure I could find quite a lot of other bits and pieces as well uh, in here that just you know just don't add up. I mean, 1916 looks particularly quiet to be perfectly honest here, uh, and it certainly wasn't. Uh, there was quite a lot going on. Uh, so you know, and I understand there is only a certain amount of space, but just to run again to the back, there are several p blank pages here just of notes. So you know they could have at least filled up some of this stuff. And again, some of these full color pictures didn't need to be in. I'm happy to see colour uh, pictures in, but you know we've already there's two there, two pages, three pages, four pages. 
you know this uh, this stuff is mounting up five pages and these could quite easily be used for some historical good historical background it seems a little bit like as i say it's first world war light to me as far as i'm concerned uh think there's some really weird things in here it seems as though because it actually mentions doing early war units it seems as though this is this is uh, aimed at i'd say 1916 onwards dog carts dog carts literally were used by the belgian army for a very limited period in uh, august of 1914 they didn't use them after that because they were nonsense why they would be running about in uh, 1918 trenches or 1918 attacks, I don't know. Again, it's one of those things that, you know, to me, I just look at that and I just, it, it makes me cringe a bit because I just think this is, uh, uh, it, it's just completely uh, against what they are, uh, against what they're trying to do from my point of view. But again, somebody who doesn't have the knowledge of the First World War probably wouldn't realise that either. So let me just find a couple of these uh, core units here. So at least here, exactly with the core units, we do have you know a unit composition of four riflemen. However, that really should be the minimum of eight because that's a section. Uh, you can add four uh, models, and it says up to a maximum of twelve models in a unit. You're not going to have that many men in a unit if you're going by the uh, prescription of the uh, the books. Arguably, yes, you might have that many in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a trench raid. You might have up to 12 men just in a small section doing a trench raid. But then also here we have, uh, you know, it says add a rifle grenade model to this unit. Uh, you can add grenades to the entire unit, which is fine. So that just, you know, that just gives you, uh, you could say, right, okay, that's a bomber section. Uh, you don't just add a single rifle grenade model. They would come at least of a two-man crew, so one fire out, one loader, and in each section you would have four rifle grenades uh, with four loaders, so you'd have eight men, and then your corporal as well. And then eight points, add a light machine gun to this, uh, with a maximum of 12 models in the unit. Now, again, even by 1918, you're only going to have two, maximum three, Lois machine guns in a section. Uh, they were big heavy things, they required a lot of men to carry the ammunition for them. Uh, in the Lewis section, basically, uh, of the uh, of 1917, you're going to have one uh, LMG. By 1918, that's increased, as I said, to up to, up to eight. This is just the British stuff. Uh, I'm not even as familiar with the German uh, doctrines as I am with the British ones. But as I say, this is, this is the kind of thing, it's like, it feels like Okay, right, I'm gonna have I'm gonna get eight riflemen, I'm gonna stick a rifle grenade in there, I'll also put some light machine guns in there. They were specific sections for specific jobs at the time, as laid out in their platoon attack doctrine. So from my point of view, as I say, I think this is very much First World War light. I think it's very much trying to be something that it isn't. If I was, if you were going to want, if you're wanting to look at something that is historically First World War, I would say get a copy of Through the Mud and the Blood by the Two Fat Lardies. If you don't like the Two Fat Lardies uh, rules, which a lot of people don't, and that's fair enough, I would at least buy them anyway, if just for the historical background, uh, because it lays out a lot more in that small book than this does. I would also say as well to, to get the Stout Hearts and Iron Troopers scenario book by the Two Fat Lardies to give you some really interesting. First World War based scenarios, which you could quite easily convert some of these lists into if you just wanted to continue playing this kind of game. Uh, but it just gives you a good idea of the kind of forces that you are going to expect to find uh, in the First World War. So that pretty much wraps up my review of it. As I said, you know, that it as a game, I think this would work pretty well because it's you know it, it seems it seems to be okay. Uh, a little vanilla for my for my tastes. I prefer a little bit more granularity in my rules. I don't really think stat lines work very well for uh, for for skirmish games so much. But again, that is just my my opinion. Yours might be completely different. And if you like the other stuff, I can imagine. For uh, you know, I I have a particular. Uh, deep feeling for the First World War so I, I'm very critical of these things however 
uh, it is nice at least to see that somebody is trying to do something with the First World War uh, and if it gets more people interested in the First World War and reading more then I don't really see a, a, such a problem with that but I just think as it stands personally uh, this is not for me uh, it, your your mileage may val, uh, may may differ, uh, but that's uh, that's my review. Uh, as I said, I, I try to be as balanced as I possibly can. I think it's a it'll be a reasonable game for somebody who's coming into wargaming. Uh, to me, it's a little feels a little light, uh, and also lacking in quite a lot of history and historical basis. Okay. Thanks for watching. I hope you've made it to this point by now. It's uh, quite a long video, uh, but I did want to go into a little bit of detail with it. Uh, if this is the kind of thing for you, then let me know. If it's not the kind of thing for you, then let me know as well. Uh, tell me if you've played it and if you've enjoyed it and what you thought about it. Uh, if you just want to play a game, then grand. Crack on. Okay, I'll wrap up there. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to this uh, channel, please do so. All that helps. Uh, if you want to help out the channel as well, you can become a channel member. You can also help by becoming a Patreon and you will get early access, ad-free videos for all my major videos. So, I shall say, thank you very much for watching this review and I'll see you in the next Storm of Steel video.